I used to watch so many of the watch mo- uh, the watch mojo um, like top ten uh, yes. put together. I love them. I love them. Welcome to Watch Mojo's Pop in the Culture, your weekly entertainment touch points. And me, well, I'm your host with the most mojo, of course. That's right, it's me, Mr. Hollywood himself, Matt Demers. Such an amazing show coming your way. I'll be speaking with the stars and the executive producer of the new Netflix series, Vikings Valhalla. Do not want to miss it. Uh, But first, well, we're going to jump into it. Here's your Hollywood headlines. All right, as we do each and every show, we kick things off with a uh, bit of a deep dive in the world of entertainment. Look at those Hollywood headlines. What's sticking out? What uh, what to chat about? And to break it all down with me, well, I've got Ricky back with, with us. Uh, hey, Ricky, how's it going? Fantastic, as always. Thanks for having me back, Matt. I love love being on the show. Well, I love having you on the show, and I got a feeling you might have some thoughts on some of the topics we're going to chat about today. We're going to yeah. kick things off with... Um, a little bit of adult animation. I, I, I love uh, animation. I've always been a fan. And I really enjoy what we're seeing now with uh, that kind of adult animation. I, I, I want you to think things. I, I mean, obviously, we know anime is out there. But now yeah. we've got things like Invincible, which was on Amazon Prime, which was right. a, a bloody good time. Great. Uh, and now we've got something coming down the pike called The Boys Diabolical. So these mm. are almost... Um, they're almost like mini shorts, animated shorts, uh, yeah. spun off of that world, The Boys, which I am a big fan of, the live action. Uh, yeah. I, I started re- actually reading some of the comics, which are pretty good there. Yeah. So uh, let's start with The Boys, and then we'll get into the adult animation stuff, because I know there's a lot out there. Uh, are you a fan of this particular property? Because it's a very different take on superheroes. I love it. I think it's I think it's so refreshing with all the Marvel content and DC content. Yeah. It's this this line between like, you know, funny and serious, but the boys just, it, it laughs in everyone's face. It gets in your face. It doesn't care about heroes, morality. You know, it, it's it's sad to say, but it's probably a very real, real just like look at how our world yes. under cap- capitalism would function and yes. turn heroes into commodities and like, you know, something to ship and sell. And, you know, it, it it's so thoughtful in the way it yeah. it melds like superhero lore with actual with the way humans would react that yeah it's 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 so good no Big you fact. nailed it as as outrageous and crazy as it all is it does feel uh almost genuine like this is how yeah. it would be these, yeah. these superheroes would be celebrities and everything that goes along with that uh so i i'm guessing i'm just guessing that you'll be tuning into this oh, yeah. uh series this anthology because it's not so i want to kind of set the stage for what this show is going to be so they're like i said they're going to be under 20 minutes they said each each animated short and each one is a different animation style which is kind of right. cool yeah uh, so, so if you look at like the trailer you know they'll see all kinds of different takes on it uh and you've got a really good uh kind of creative minds behind it i know seth rogan and his writing partner did one justin i don't know Roiland. justin Roiland from rick and morty is on there yeah I mean, like the, the, the list, honestly, I was looking at the credit. There's so many people on this project. It's, it's mind-blowing. So much good talent. Um, and it brings to mind uh, something that Disney recently did, which is called Star Wars Visions, which is literally an anthology series by uh, Japanese animators in the Star Wars universe telling different stories. And I and this is kind of, you know, this is a step that the boys is taking now with Diabolical. And I think it's really great to be able to explore these universes with different talents and different minds giving their own take on each. I think that's something we're gonna start seeing a lot more as we try to expand in TV. Instead of making sequels, we'll be doing anthologies, we'll be doing other kind of things, offsets in that in those universes. So yeah, super, super excited. And the minds behind it are just really, it's, it's gonna be fantastic the way the boys is fantastic in my opinion. Yeah, I'm totally gonna check it out, and I'm on the animation train. Like I, like I said, I mentioned Invincible, which which really hooked me. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of great stuff out there. Any uh, kind of animation that, that that you've been enjoying that people might want to check out? Oh uh, yeah, what? Netflix has been on fire. Honestly, recently oh. they they've been they've been putting out uh, Castlevania. Incredible, incredible, oh, yeah. incredible. So good. Animation is great. Acting is great. Script is great. Blood of Zeus. Um, or the son of Zeus. I think it's Blood of Zeus, another great animation style from the same studio. You have uh, Arcane, which um, is, yes. is kind of groundbreaking in a way because it's not just an it's animation, but it's it's melded so well with motion capture and almost looks like this. It's a it's a really unique style, and and that you know that's been a critical success based on League of Legends. 
Then, of course, you've got like Dota, Dragon's Blood, which is another just launched its second season based on another huge video game property. So Netflix is clearly a lot of companies are, but Netflix has really taken adult animation and they've said this is a serious art form and like people want well written good stories, good animation, and they're giving it to us. And like, it's, it's paying off. It's they're, they're, they're leading the way, honestly, it's really impressive. No, you're right. And I, uh, and I like that we're getting uh, these kind of animated spinoffs of, of uh, franchises and properties, as you mentioned with star Wars and now obviously the boys. So that's excited. Exciting. Uh, speaking of which, if you are a fan of uncharted, the video mm. game, you may have been excited to see the movie. Now here's the thing. It, it, we'll just start by saying it was a hit. Uh, yep. it, it made it made it made bank, as they say in Hollywood. Uh, they're actually already talking about a, about a sequel. This is the of one course. with Tom Holland, uh, Mark Marky Mark Mark Wahlberg in there. <laughs> Reviews were kind of poor. I, I saw it. I saw it. I, I, listen, it's okay. It's not a game changer. It's not. No. Uh, we're not changing the game here. I think it was fun watch. Holland Tom Holland's very easy to watch. Very likable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed the chemistry. I, I'm. I think there's room to improve. But I mean, there's worse ways to spend two hours right uh, what's your take on uncharted and do you think there's enough there to create kind of a, a bigger franchise yeah so you know uncharted uh, came out on the playstation years ago if i it was either 2007 or 2009 when the first one i think it was 2007 so it's been a franchise for a very long time from a really prominent studio um and the writing has always been amazing the you know the character development the the kind of the, the world building and the and the story itself has always been really really good so it's it's ripe for making it into a series or a film. Now, mm. with all adaptations, you, I never expect them to be good. <laughs> it's just, it's a default setting for video game adaptations. We haven't, the way superheroes no. took a very long time to get good, yeah. video games are going to take the same. And th th it's sad because there are really great teams, really great writing and, 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 and world building happening. Um, but maybe we'll see that with HBO, which is releasing The Last of Us, which is from the same people who make yes. Uncharted with Pedro Pascal. So yes. we're starting to see these things being taken seriously, video games being taken seriously. Now, I knew this was going to be kind of like a Tomb Raider, you know, fair. Like you're going in for a good time. You see some crazy action pieces. You know, if you played the games, you'll 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 recognize some references here and there. It's Tom Holland again, easy to watch. So, not not surprised that the reviews were middling to whatever. But uh, I think there's, like I said, room to improve. There's so much story in the Uncharted universe. There's so many great characters. There's so many places it can go. Um, and I hopefully it just gets better from here. But I'm I'm just happy to see that you know the video games are being taken seriously and it was something that crazy like roger i think on roger ebert.com maybe it was uh, a couple of days ago i saw that they did like a video game review for horizon or something and it got like it's like a perfect score and i'm thinking when when this website when roger ebert is, is talking about gaming you know the yeah. same kind of the, the organization that said that it wasn't really an art form you know it's come so far yeah, yeah. and that's just really nice to see in general full circle yeah exactly all right, I'm going to stick on the uh, the video game train with you, Ricky, because you are obviously uh, one of the voices over there on uh, Mojo Plays, the video game channel. I, I, I dabble. I say this every time. I enjoy a good video game when I go to yeah. friends' houses, friends and family that have it. Um, I don't know much, so I always love having the video guys on to, to yeah. do some to some recommendations. I know you gave some not long ago. I don't know if there's anything else that you think we have to be playing or something that maybe uh, is on the horizon. What do you got for us, Ricky? <laughs> well, speaking of on the horizon, um, Horizon Forbidden West just came out on Friday, uh, February 18th, which is you know it's a sequel to one of the most one of the most well received games in a long time, Horizon Zero Dawn, and uh, it's it's got incredible incredible reviews. Um, a really, really strong female lead at the center who, who like, who, it's an, it's such an amazing job with the voice acting and with it, with the character building and the world itself is just, it's stunning. You can visit the ruins of uh, California in this post-apocalyptic world where, you know, robot dinosaurs are roaming around. So I highly recommend that if you've got a PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, check that out. Uh, another great game that's coming out in February 25th is Elden Ring which is by George R. R. Martin, who helped write it, and um, uh, Hidetaka Miyazaki, who directs the Dark Souls games, which, as any hardcore gamer knows, are like the pinnacle of, uh, of skill testing and world building and, and deep lore games. So that's coming out February 25th. We were super lucky at Watch Mojo to get to work with them. We actually have uh, five videos that we did with them, um, a campaign, and that was just such a joy. So those two big heavy hitter open world games. Wow. Now, for, for a little more variety, I'd say Gran Turismo 7, if you're a racing fan, you're going to love that. It's coming out the same day as The Boys Diabolical and the new Batman movie. Batman. So, right? Yes. There's, there's a lot to crunch in there. 
There's a March Kirby 4th, game. March 4th is Christmas for us uh, geeks. Yeah. There's yes, a new Kirby? A, Wait a minute. Hold on. There's a, a, there's, a new, there's a new Kirby, open world Kirby in the vein of um, Super Mario Odyssey coming out March 25th. Looks absolutely gorgeous. It's been way overdue since Kirby's had a big adventure like this. So there's that. And then finally, finally for the movie fans, there's Lego Star Wars, the Skywalker saga, which looks so cool. Uh, Star, Lego games are great. And the Star Wars universe is so big and there's so much fun to be had that I think, you, if, you know, if you're a fan of Lego, you're a fan of Star Wars, please, please, please pick up this game. Yeah. Um, amazing. Right. Okay. Well, there you go. I, I got, I'm going to be wasting a lot of money in the next couple <laughs> yeah. of weeks for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ricky, don't, don't go anywhere because right now, me and you, we got to go be on the list. All right, Ricky, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to dig deep in that uh, vast archives of Watch Mojo, pluck out an old top 10 list, go beyond that list with our own personal opinions, our takes, hot takes. Uh, today was a fun one. It's uh, top 10 amazing movies that uh, should have been made. So these are movies that weren't made, should have been made. They probably would have been cool. Yeah. Me and you, we'll decide. We'll decide as we go through it. Uh, but this is fun because it's always uh, that, that what if factor. And hey, in Hollywood, you never say never because listen, we're seeing all kinds of kind of things come to fruition with all the multiverse yep. uh, storylines, you know, all kinds of stuff. So maybe these movies will, a version of them or something will get made all, uh, down the line. Number 10 is, is a fun one for me because I am obsessed with looking at uh, Nicolas Cage in the Superman mm. outfit, yeah. right? There was all kinds of... Pr this one actually came very close to being made. We're talking Superman Lives. This is number 10 on the list. This was a Tim Burton directed oh, Superman movie. I would have loved this, I think, because it would have been loved it. very different. I love, Yeah, Tim Burton doing anything is, is amazing. Um, I would have absolutely loved to see Tim Burton directing Nick Cage as Superman. That, I don't know how amazing the movie would be, but I, I, I really do feel bad that it never got made because it could have just changed the course of, you know, DC forever. I mean, you don't, we don't know. We don't know. It, it never got made. It never got made. It would have been, would have been interesting because... Well, Nicolas Cage as super, I mean, he's this is a guy who's obsessed with Superman. By the way, he named yeah. his kid Kal El. Um, yeah. But also in the casting that they had was Chris Rock yes. as Jimmy Olsen. Yeah. Okay. And Christopher Walken was going to be the ideal Brainiac. Brainiac. Yeah. Oh what? man, I could see. I could have seen that. Christopher Walken as Brainiac. Oh man, I, I I don't know. This it's it's like a carnival, honestly. It's a Tim Burton carnival of a movie that I would have loved to see. But I see why people might have been like, this might be a little bit, a little bit too crazy. I don't know. I yeah. I, I I don't know. It, it it's got a it's got a weird cast, but I'm down. Yeah, I I mean maybe one day, maybe one day. There's a documentary on it too, actually, that I've, mm. I've been meaning to get around to watching. Number nine is interesting because it's a it's a very big franchise, very big character. Uh, we know Frankenstein, obviously the uh, Frankenstein's monster. Uh, yeah. There was almost a version of the movie directed by David Cronenberg. Mm -hmm. For those that know Cronenberg, well, he's done what has he done? The Fly. He's done uh, Scanners. He's done a multitude of things. This guy knows how to do body horror right. Yeah. I yeah. would have loved to seen this as well. Yeah, uh, I think we're over. We're long overdue for a Frankenstein movie, a good one with nuance um, that brings the character uh, that brings the character closer to like uh, a, this damaged kind of being that wants You're to right. be understood rather than some just like monster. You know, and I think Cronenberg would have would have brought that to the project if it had come through fruition. Um, but it, it's a classic story, and it, it's definitely one that I think you know the way they redid Mac Macbeth. Um, these, these kind of these old stories get a good cast. And mm -hmm. get people get people on it and do a do a story that does the source material justice. I am sad that that didn't get made. It would have been it would have been cool to see. But like you said, in Hollywood, these old ideas, especially, they always come back around at some point. So, um, yeah, I, I think we'll be seeing a Frankenstein in the next like ten years. Because that's a big property. Yeah, Frankenstein. Everyone knows that name. So you're yeah. right. It's it's right for the picking. Right for the pick. And number eight on this list was a canceled Disney movie. That's and so what happened here is Disney actually announced it. And then they canceled it. That's not. That's very rare. Weird. So a lot of people were excited about this one. It was called uh, Gigantic. 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 Yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, so I don't. I'm not really sure exactly what went wrong, but it was going to be the director of Tangled, um, songwriters from Frozen. I mean, yeah, this it was. Is... Cr it was creative differences. Was the ultimate. You know, they kind of Disney kind of just went out with a fizzle. 
creative differences means who knows look at the writer that the, the people who are writing the songs you know didn't care about the story whatever the heck it was <laughs> um it is very rare that a disney animated film gets outright canceled after like such a big announcement so it must have been pretty significant um but it's a jack and the beanstalk essentially it's a jack and the beanstalk like one off you know where they kind of tell that story through the disney lens so there's still uh, there's still opportunity for something like that to come to come down the line um if they want to retell that story i think disney can easily do that but would have been nice to see it. It looked cool. The animation looked cool. That first opening scene with all the bootlegged kind of yeah. DVDs was fun. I was gonna say that I, I'm I'm picturing like I I'm picturing actually things from this movie. And I guess they actually had some promos or whatever yeah. come out. So yeah, that's a shame. Uh, number seven. Speaking of shame, uh, Justice League Mortal. Mm. Do Do you know the story behind this? Uh, not fully. A little bit. They were going to make a Justice League, a Justice League movie all the way back at 2007. Yeah, 2007. Yeah. George Miller. George yeah. Miller, who's Crazy. so great with, in the action genre, was going to put together this great movie. He had, every, he had the cast already locked down. Yeah. Uh, and I, and, it, and it, what happened was that there was a big writer's strike. 2007, uh, that, yeah. Yeah, that just kind of paralyzed Hollywood for, for a couple months. And that just threw a huge wrench and the project never could never get back on its feet. It just uh, went away so that, yeah, the, the, then they decided to focus on 2011's Green Lantern. Yeah, what a, that was and, terrible. <laughs> and we, know, we know how that turned out. But yeah, no, this would have been a Justice League movie all the way back in, uh, in 2007. And they had uh, uh, Adam Brody, who, yes. who was big on the OC at the time. <laughs> yes. He was going to be the Flash. Army Hammer is Batman. I can see it. I mean, now Army Hammer's got his own. He's, he's Hannibal Lecter right now. But. Yeah, there's a whole yeah. whole other thing. Google it. I'm not getting into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the time, sure, he may have been a good uh, Batman. Common would have been Green Lantern. Common. Love to see that. I would have loved to see what? that. Every... So great. So yeah, this would have been. Um, I don't know. This is a movie that I'm like. This would have been good. I think. <laughs> I mean, like, again, that was kind of the territory where we, we were still in the early days of superhero movies. So maybe it could have been the first big success. Yeah. And that could have, again, changed the course of the DCEU. And, but yes. we'll never know. We'll never we'll know. We'll never know because then they did Green Lantern in it. Green Lantern, yeah. Did not do well. Uh, number six is uh, Halo. Halo, now that we are getting a Halo series. This was a movie that was, uh, and I remember this being very much in the news, Neil Blomkamp. Was yeah. the guy behind this? District Blom Nine. Yeah, Blomkamp did Amazing. District Nine. He did uh, Elysium, I think, was his other one. Yeah. I don't know if he's done much recently, but uh, I remember District Nine blew a lot of people away, myself included. If you're a sci-fi yes. fan, I am. Was, I love. I love District Nine. It was so good. It was so a great. very unique take on, on Aliens too. Yeah, cool. yeah. And the way it was done, it was almost docu uh, documentary style. Documentary mixed, style. Yeah, and now uh, picturing that in the Halo uh, universe, yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah, it, it would have been amazing. Halo really lends itself to that kind of apocalyptic um, politics between you know humans, aliens, the, the, the fate of the world. I think that could have been really cool, but I am happy to see that there's a series. I feel I feel like a series is, is better only because it just has more time to flesh out the more characters time. in the world. And so I think certain games absolutely, they, they benefit more from a series than a standalone movie. So I'm hoping that the Paramount Plus Halo is going to delve into that and really give us a good feel for that world because it's really rich, a really rich sci-fi world that's been around for so long. So good things at the end of it. You know, the movie got canceled, but we're getting a TV series. And it's kind of like what we're saying. Good ideas, you know, they, they always come back. They're not going to ever die. They, they're also, there's going to be somebody to pick up the torch and down the line you'll see something you know, the way Squid Games took 10 years to get made, you know, like it, it, it's going to, good ideas just don't, they don't die. You know, they get reused, they get updated, but so, yeah, I'm yeah. excited to see that. Funding issues was the problem with this. Apparently it was going to cost too much money. Funding yeah. issues. Uh, number five is Spider-Man 4. Spider-Man 4. This, of course, being the Tobey Maguire Spider-Mans. Mm -hmm. There was a fourth one uh, that was pretty, pretty well ahead uh, script-wise. They had, they had kind of mapped out uh, the villains, Kurt Connors, of course, we know who becomes the lizard. We would have seen that in the Tobey Maguire uh, worlds. But, of course, Spider-Man 3, that was the one with Venom. Mm. Um, the, dark, and, the dark horse of uh, the Spider-Man movies. Yeah, yeah that, that didn't uh, didn't do so well uh, critically. No. Uh, and what's interesting about this, because this is Sam Raimi, and he would have actually had Bruce Campbell um, mm. cameo as Mysterio. 
That's that would have been so cool because Bruce, yeah. Bruce Campbell's got that. He, he is that. He's now that I see it, you know, it's like yeah. if a younger Bruce Campbell could have totally, totally played Mysterio in the in the MCU. Yeah, but now we're seeing the resurgence of these Spider Men. So there's so much nostalgia. Uh, I mean, there's already talks that maybe Andrew Garfield might actually yeah. get his third movie. Yeah. So who knows? Maybe we'll get Tobey Maguire his fourth movie as well. Maybe. We'll see, Sony. We'll see. <laughs> the power of online petitions. I never thought the Snyder cut would ever get released. I mean, the people want what the people want. No, I didn't. But you know what? It was already the thing with Justice League. It was already so far down in the dumps that like there was. You got to do something to make it better. And if, it's if, 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 if you know what I'm saying, it's like if, if if the audience thinks that the Snyder Cut is the answer to the shitting to the, the problem of that movie, <laughs> then DC would be stupid not to release it and be like, you yeah. know, you know, like come on. Yeah, exactly. All right, number four on this list of movies that should have been amazing if they were made is um, a confederacy. <clears throat> excuse me, a confederacy of dunces. This was mm. Harold Ramis. I don't know too much about this. Usually, I've heard about it, but it was set to uh, uh, be starring John Belushi. Was going to be in the lead role. Belushi had passed. John Candy and Chris Farley were later considered for this. Um, before their untimely passings. So this yeah. is actually based on something of a, of a novel that, yeah. I, that I'm not too familiar with. But, I mean, you got Harold Ramis, and you're going to mm. pair him with the likes of John Belushi, and then obviously he passed away, and, and even with John Candy or Chris Farley. I'm in. Yeah, I, I get it's, it's one. Of, it's maybe on the list it's one of the ones that I don't really know, maybe just because it's a bit older. But, um, I mean, yeah, to see those, those two in a role, I mean, they're both you know giants and legends you know, when it comes to comedy and acting. So a missed opportunity, in my opinion. Apparently, it was very hard to make. It was it was like really hard to make or direct. There's like maybe the way the book was written, the novel was written. Yeah. I think there was like a, there was an issue with how you're going to put that on a screen. And you see that you see that pretty often where you're not sure how to translate something to to give the right feeling that the, the novel is trying to. So maybe they just said, you know, it's just not going to work. You're right, and it's not the first time because they tried it again, according to Watch Mojo. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2005, uh, Steven Sonnenberg was going to unite oh, wow. Will Ferrell, Jesse Eisenberg, Lily Tomlin, Paul Rudd. And then uh, there was just multiple things that happened, including Hurricane Katrina, which was where they're going to shoot some part of the story. So will this ever happen? I don't know. It seems like they're, they're, they keep trying every yeah. couple of years, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they'll get this movie that I've never heard of, but apparently it's worth it. If they keep trying. Double V Vega is number three. This is Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Uh, this Tar would have been really cool. This would have been really cool. It was a melding of, it would have been the Tarantino verse. It was yep. a melding of two of his movies, right? Yep. Um, Pulp Fiction. And Reservoir. And, um, Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, he I mean, just never, yeah, that, and, and, and the reason here is he just never got around to making it. He's a busy man. He's a busy man. And he wanted to, uh, he wanted to be the one to do it, obviously. Maybe, you know, uh, who knows? Who knows? Like you said, these ideas always come back around. I know he just fin he's just finished uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood not long ago. So he, he's, he's crazy, right? He just, he does everything, that guy. He's really something. He's great. Uh, I love it. I love Tarantino's movies. There's not one that I, that's not, it's, when you watch a Tarantino movie, it's not whether it's going to be good. It's whether it's going to be great. Because you know yeah. it's going to be good regardless. Yeah. It's just some yeah. will be better than others, right? He's, he's such a master. He's a master. He's a master. So just, uh. I don't know. That would have been cool, though. That would have been cool. All right. Number two is Bioshock. Bioshock. Mm. I think we have a video game theme going on on, on, this, we, we... on this episode. Um, 2008. 2008. They were attempting the Bioshock film. But... Too expensive. Too, too expensive. expensive. It was like 200... I think it was... Um... Two hundred million dollars. He won from Universal. Gore Verbinski. You're right. And they just said... They just said, no... It's too expensive, and I don't blame them. Look, Bioshock is amazing, and I, there is—I think there is talks right now of there going of being a, a, a series coming out. Because again, like I said, this this is a world that yeah. would probably benefit more from a series than a movie. The writing is very, very, very strong. Um, the world is incredible. Rapture is incredible. So this—I I have no doubt that we—and there's a new Bioshock on the way in the next couple of years as a game. Okay. Um, so so there's no doubt that this is going to be made at some point. If it's not Netflix, it's going to be somebody else. But yeah, it's it's another one of those things that like it's going to come back. It is Netflix. Netflix is the one that, that apparently, as of this year, 
<laughs> right, right, right. There was announcements made that, that Netflix will be making Bioshock. But yeah, 200 million, that was a, ho- a heavy price tag. And But I feel like 2008 wasn't the right time, right? Like, I feel like now is the right time. Yes, absolutely. With streaming especially. I think streaming services yes. help a lot because it, it, you have much more access. And it, the, these kind of, res- you know, these monetary restrictions, Netflix has thrown them in the garbage. A lot of them are thrown in the garbage. Like, people yeah. have the ability to make what they want and money doesn't really matter anymore. The pockets are so deep, which is amazing for consumers. It's amazing for us because we get... High quality TV, better than most movies at this point, man. We're in the yeah. golden age. The the industry is changing. So now is the time. Now is the time for Bioshock. All right, there are a few honorable mentions of movies that we didn't get. Uh, there was going to be a Baz, uh, or, sorry, Baz Luhrmann, uh, Alexander the Great. He's the guy that did uh, Moulin Rouge. Could have yeah. been interesting. <laughs> Moulin Rouge, Alexander the Great film. That could have been interesting. True Lies 2. Why? We never got a True Lies 2. Schwarzenegger, <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis. I would have yeah. been in interesting maybe uh tron 3 ah, tron is that one that one whatever. franchise that they did you know it's like a keeps, it just it, stalls, it was like it keeps whatever stalls. i don't know it's just not that it, like it's not that interesting no like, i don't know yeah no the first <laughs> the first movie watching it today you're like what what is this what the heck's going on yeah and then the the the, the daft punk version is which i call it because it's the Daft Punk version. It's like a big Daft Punk music video, it's right? It's one music music video. Yes, that's, that's perfect. What I, that's yes. I feel like I'm watching Absolutely. it. Absolutely, it's okay. Right. It's okay. Visually exciting, but I don't know. Not too much to hang your hat on for a a, a bunch of sequels. And then uh, we had uh, what is this? Twenty thousand leagues under the sea. Under the sea. Yeah. Shall David Fincher. Go? David Fincher. This was uh, this is going to make it with Disney. It's still possible. It's still I possible. like we'll I like it. me some Fincher. Yeah. All right, number one, the movie that should have been amazing, but we never got, was a, a Stanley Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick <sighs> film. He was going to do Napoleon. Can you imagine Kubrick doing Napoleon? If you're a cinephile, if you're a movie guy and you know Stanley Kubrick like I do. Oh, my God, dude. You know I that love... this would have been a chef's kiss, I think. I need to, First off, it needs to be done. I think Napoleon is such a crazy yeah. historical figure. He's up there with Alexander the Great. Such a crazy historical figure. There, like, and Kub- I, I honestly, it's sad to say, but like, it's ve- there are very few people who can make this movie. I think the way Kubrick would have made it. Yeah. Um, in terms of the attention to detail, the man was manic. He was crazy. He was crazy. He, he would, he, you know, the ideas that he had, especially for 2001, the way he revolutionized cinema, just the use of camera techniques and practical effects, and you know, this movie would have been. This movie would have been insane, and I, I feel like it absolutely needs to be done by some prolific director. I don't know who, but somebody's got to do it. And once again, it is. Uh, it was the budget. It was the budget. It's Kubrick actually, he he did so much research and knew exactly what he wanted to do, knew exactly how it was going to be made, and he had a number. And when they couldn't do it, then he was like, "Well, we can't do it. We can't do it." It's everything to- you want from a director. Like, how, what more do you want? The guy did all the work, and he's like, "Here, <laughs> just give it to me, and I'll make it." And they're like, "No." We can't. Too much. Too much money. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a mini series that might be in the work, but I think you're right. Napoleon's got a lot of uh, a lot of potential. Uh, Ricky, this has been fun. Before we go, I ha- I, I want to mention this with somebody because I'm a huge Elvis Presley fan. And I don't Ooh. know if you saw, but we got a trailer for an Elvis Presley biopic. Yes. Yes. That, I'm going to watch that. Uh, speaking of, uh, Bo- it's Boz Luhrmann. That, Boz that's, Luhrmann, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think it looks sick. I think it looks amazing. Are you an Elvis fan? Because this is a movie that I don't know what took so long, but I'm excited yeah. to see Elvis on the big screen. I, I am absolutely excited. Um, I wouldn't. I, I, I look. I listen to Elvis. My I grew. I grew up. My mom listened to a lot of Elvis, so yeah. I know the music. I've seen the movies in Acapulco. Like so, I, you know, I grew up with him. So I'm <laughs> super, super happy to be seeing an, a biopic made because it, it really is overdue. I mean. He's like the you know he's like it's in the league with the Beatles in terms of legends of music. He's the king. Uh, he's the king. Um, yeah, it's gonna be crazy. I'm I'm super excited. It's gonna be awesome. I I, I love good biopics, man. A good biopic, because it's like oh my god, that happened. What? No. And then you look it up and you're like no, it really happened. And you're like this is crazy. Like this people live crazy lives. Yeah, and Elvis was one of them. So uh, now is the time that we're going to get these movies. I can feel it. I can feel it. So any yeah. any of those ones that we just talked about, maybe we'll get them. Uh, what do you guys out there think? Is there anyone that you were dying to see? Drop it in the comments. And Ricky, I can't thank you enough for joining me once again. It's a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And I can't wait to be back. All right. Well, let's let's jump into our Mojo Chats. Yes, Chats with an S of the week. I'm talking with the cast and the director of the new Netflix series Vikings. Valhalla. 
Awesome. Hey, All right. hey gentlemen. I used to watch so many of the Watch Mo uh, the Watch Mojo um, like top ten uh, yes. put together. I love them. I love them. You know what? Watch Mojo audiences do love a little bit of Vikings. Yeah, we we love our man we love our man buns, our beards, the the battlefields. We can prep all that because Vikings Valhalla is here. Uh, I'm so excited to break it down. I got uh, Sam. I got Leo. Uh, let's talk about it. I'm looking for the tease, gentlemen. I'm looking for the tease. Uh, Sam, start with you. Give us a, a little bit of a breakdown of what we can expect out of your particular character. Oh, well, we're seeing a bit of a journey of uh, a man trying to find himself in the world that's ever changing. He's from Greenland. He's the son of notoriously one of the most violent Vikings that has ever lived. And um, he's uh, trying to find himself outside of that name. And, you know, he's t t trying to take care of the people that he loves. And that takes him on an epic journey across seas. And he's um, acquiring tools that soon, you know, make him legend. Yeah, epic, I think, is is definitely the word of the day when it comes to this show. Uh, Leo, what about you? Yeah, well, I play Harald Sigurdsson, who's later known as Harald Hardrada, because he becomes king of Norway. But at the moment, when we find him, he's a prince of Norway. And uh, I think maybe he thinks that, yeah, <laughs> I think no he, big deal. he could get there easily. But um, life gets in the way, and uh, his path to becoming king gets complicated. And he finds himself with a Greenlander as a best friend. Um, so yeah, it's that story of, of figuring out that the world is, is a big, dark, scary place, especially in Viking times and you've got it's sink or swim. So, yes, that's a good idea. Sink or swim, put that on the, uh, on the reviews. Um, okay. I love the look of this show. It's so vast. It's sweeping. I love the design, the production, the costumes. Uh, I've been asking people if you were able to take something home with you maybe it's a piece of clothing that, that you were uh wearing on the show maybe it's a weapon maybe it's a sword uh you want to hang something on your wall is there something and maybe you've already taken something uh sam do you have something that you'd like i i like little things so i i really love the um the viking um armband yes i do That's really cool yeah but I also like want to shout out the, the my armor in episode eight that was actually made of vegan leather, and um, our head costume designer Susan actually made that for myself being vegan. It was like, yeah, it was just a suggestion, but the fact that they went ahead and made it was very nice of them. That's amazing. Hey, that's amazing stuff. Hey, Leo, last word to you. Well, yeah, I think armband is cool, but I would take my ink, my tats. I've got two mm. sleeves. And as an actor, you, it's difficult to get tattoos because it makes life a little longer and harder in the makeup chair in the morning. So yeah, to have those Viking sleeve tattoos, I really enjoy putting them on and that helped me get into character no end. So, so yeah, I'll take those. All right, amazing. Well, top 10 best Vikings on television. Well, Sam Leo, you guys topped that list. Uh, we'll be checking out Vikings Valhalla over there on Netflix. <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, Vikings Valhalla is upon us. Prep the battlefield. Uh, Netflix has got your fix, and I've got uh, the showrunner, the EP, the executive producer. Hey, Jeb, how's it going? It's going great, Matt. It really is. Hey, listen, I'm excited to talk with you because I'm one of those people that was really a really big fan of that original Vikings. So when I found out that there was another one, my excitement went through the roof. Uh, break it down. Give us a tease. I mean, you're the right guy to do just that. What can I and the rest of the people out there expect out of this one? Well, I think if you're a fan of the old show, I'm hoping that you won't be disappointed. But if you've never seen a Viking or you wouldn't know one if you bumped into it on the street, I think you can get into Valhalla very easily. I think that the, we've moved the story 125 years farther ahead. And what that means is that our Vikings are no longer just this homogenous group of, uh, of, of, of folks who are all pagan and, you know, they're raiding in England. It's a group that's now traveled quite a bit. So it's, it's a group that has many more experiences um, than the original group has had. And, and I think they're dealing with other things. For example, they're now pagan and Christian Vikings and Christianity is rushing over Scandinavia. What does that mean? What, what do people want to do? I also think the Viking world has expanded from Norway. Now, you know, we've not only gone to Iceland, but we have the Greenlanders. We have pushed all the way out to the end of the envelope. And, you know, uh, those, those folks that are out there, and two of our characters come from Greenland, Leif Erikson, his sister, Freydis, 
they know nothing about the old land. You know, that's where their father came from. So they have to be reintroduced to this whole area. So it creates an exciting cauldron with a lot of different moving characters. Yeah, no, I can tell there's a lot of moving pieces, uh, a lot of depth to the story, which is great. Obviously, production design. I mean, that's just all fantastic. Um, talk to me about because we're including uh, historical figures in here as well. I mean, there's a there's a melding. Is this something um, that high school history teachers will be like scoffing at or, <laughs> or how historically accurate are we are we going here? Well, you know, the, it's, it's interesting. We're, it, we, we're dealing with characters that are more historic. We know more historically about them, say, than the original story, where a lot of those, it was the original Vikings had a lot of more mythic figures. Um, by the time we get to the 11th century, yeah, we know a little bit about Leif Erikson. We know about Freyda's Eric's daughter, his sister. We know about Harold Sigurdsson. We obviously know about Canute the Great and, and, and Emma of Normandy and Athelred. So yes, there's a lot of historical accuracy and we, and we aim to try to use as much of the storylines that are as possible. But it, you know, for example, Leif and Harold may not have ever bumped into each other, much less be in the same time zone. So, um, so yeah, a, a history teacher would probably do this to that. But in terms of the authenticity of it, uh, it's incredibly accurate for a show of this, of this scale. Amazing. Well, I can't wait to check it out, and uh, I can't wait to see where this franchise goes. I mean, Netflix likes to do those animated spinoffs, huh? Vikings animated? <laughs> I'm up for anything, man. I'm Amazing. Sure. All right. Well, I'll be checking it all out over there on Netflix. Thanks, Jeff. Vikings Valhalla is upon us. That's right. The uh, fever pitch, the anticipation, it's over. Prep the battlefield. Let's learn all about it. And uh, here to break down his particular character, I've got David. Hey, David, how's it going? It's going very well. Thanks, Matt. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm one of those people that was a big fan of the original Viking series. So mm -hmm. I was super, super stoked uh, when I found out we were getting this uh, this sequel. I guess you can call it a sequel, right? It's Yeah, I think you call it a sequel. Continuing on many years later. Uh, okay, break down your particular character. Give us a bit of a tease, David. Who are you playing and what can uh, fans expect out of you? So I'm a Saxon. <laughs> so from the, from the start off, um, I'm not necessarily someone that people will, will be rooting for. Um, however, uh, he is a survivor. He manages to uh, exist with his head upon his shoulders um, under several uh, kings of England and including Viking kings of England who come in later. So yeah, he's one to watch. One to watch and, and one to love to hate. I think that's a term I like to use for certain characters. Um, what, what was the heart? Because I, I can imagine doing these period projects as an actor. It's kind of fun, but I think it could also be kind of difficult, right? Was that the case for you? And if so, what was the most difficult part? I mean, I've, I've done my fair share of period drama across the times. I, I've, I find it substantially easier to act when you actually are in a castle wearing actual clothes upon a, an actual horse as opposed to stroking a tennis ball and wearing green fabric. Um, maybe it's just because I'm not very good at imagining things. Um, no, I, I love doing period drama. There's a reason why I've been doing so much of it. It's a chance to get to know and explore periods of history that you thought you knew, periods of history that you didn't know. And didn't want to get to know and then periods of history that you were always looking for an opportunity to delve into and when it comes to vikings and in particular the viking history upon uh, the british and english continent uh, country um yeah it's it's a perfect opportunity to do that how do you prepare for that are you reading lots of books are you visiting museums are you learning to talk like uh what's the preparation heading into something like that um, you read as much as you can, and you read it with uh, the caveat of knowing that they didn't necessarily have all the facts themselves, that things have been lost over time, that things have been recreated retroactively after the time. So um, for all those historical purists out there, yeah, I'm sure there are some anachronisms that we may fall into over the course of this show. But also historical truth and certainty is, is a rare, very rare commodity. Um, but yeah, you read a lot about it. You get to know the character through the facts that we know for certain. And then you get someone like Jeb to fill in the, the, the gaps to make it juicy and exciting. Is there someone on set going, no, 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 uh, don't, don't say that. Get that coffee cup out of there. Is there, is there that uh, guy? There, that guy is around, uh, but he's hidden behind a mask these days. So you can never hear him if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right, last question before we go. I love the outfits and the costumes and obviously the production design and uh, costume design, hair, all that stuff is amazing on these shows. If you were to take one of those pieces home with you, I don't know if it's something you want to wear, hang it on your wall. What, what, what I mean, would you take? 
Uh, all of mine are all quite black. <laughs> um, uh, not that I'm the bad guy or anything. Um, yeah, they're, they're all wonderful. I mean, most of them, all by one, actually, have all been created for me. So that's always a great perk of being in a, in a good piece of historical fiction. Uh, is to be tailored for. Um, I can see yourself looking very dapper with your colour coordinator jacket and um, maybe, is that a kitchen? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but no, I don't know. I'd, 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 I'd take all of them. Like it's, it's nice to have a wardrobe, one for every day of the week, so can't complain. Amazing. I'll take some of your black wardrobe if you don't want it. Uh, thank <laughs> you so yours. much, David. And uh, Vikings Valhalla over there on Netflix. All right, prep the battlefield, everybody. If you want more Vikings, you got it. Netflix has Vikings Valhalla. It's finally upon us. I can't wait to break it down uh, with these two gentlemen here. Uh, we got Bradley. We got Johannes. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to start with you, Bradley. Give us the tease of who you're playing, your particular character, and what we can expect out of you. So I am playing King Canute in the Netflix uh, series Vikings Valhalla. Um, and you can expect to see him dominating the uh, northern European region. <laughs> He's getting the Vikings together to avenge the massacre of the, uh, the uh, Danelaw areas of Saxon England. Uh -huh. are, are we, are, are audiences going to like your character? Is it one of those... Uh uh, well, I mean, you know, yes, I, I would hope so. He, uh, the, the story is told from uh, the perspective of the Vikings. And so we are, we see that the Vikings have been um, uh, used unjustly by the Saxon English and the, uh, they're off to seek revenge. So as long as you're siding with the Vikings and not with the Saxons, then yes, you're going to see me as a good guy. I side with whoever has the best outfits. That's my... <laughs> well, it's definitely going to be on my side then. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Johannes, uh, give give us your your breakdown, your your tease. Yes, I play I play Olaf Haraldsson, who wants to be king, needs to be king, and will stop at nothing to achieve his goals. And uh, you know, if you Google him, you're going to see that you know maybe uh, maybe he gets what he wants. So your your character is actually based on 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 someone in real life. Yeah, my my Olaf Haraldsson is uh, after his death became a saint in the Catholic Church, Saint Olaf, and uh, is uh, today still the eternal king of Norway, and his insignia is still in the Norwegian emblem. So he's uh, he's very much a, a big historical character here in the Nordic region. Amazing, amazing. Well, I've been asking the actors uh, in your program how you guys prepare, um, because, I mean, to take yourself that far back, I mean, it's got to be uh, pretty daunting. Um, Johannes, I mean, we'll stick with you, and then we'll go to Bradley quickly. How do you prepare for something like this that far ago? Well, you just learn your lines and show up on time, really. But, uh, but you know, I say that with a smile, but it's in, in a way it's true, because the, the sets and the costume and, and everything we have, it doesn't, you know, there's not much left for the imagination. It's all right there. It's amazing what they've built in Ireland. And of course, uh, we're utilizing what they used on the on the other Viking show to make this new Viking show, Vikings Valhalla, which is set 100 years later, but in the same world. And that world is very much alive and existing in Ireland today. And it's, if you show up and you know your lines, it's right there. Same for you, Bradley? Yeah, well, I'm not sure that there's any real difference, unfortunately. You know, there's not much imagination that's required. You say going back to the 11th century to uh, recreate these, these, these hungry, these power hungry uh, rulers of the world. And, you know, you could probably, uh, you could probably set it uh, uh, today and um, you'd get much the same sort of people. Amazing. Well, hey, listen, I can't wait to check it all out. We encourage everyone else to do so over there on Netflix. Well, that's going to do it for another episode, everybody. Uh, my thanks to everyone over there at Netflix and Vikings Valhalla. Cannot wait to binge that entire series. And Ricky, Ricky Tucci for joining me and bringing the fun. And hey, thank you for watching and listening. Till next time, I've been Mr. Hollywood, popping the culture.